Good morning, everybody. Hello. 2022. It's going pretty good so far, I guess. Uh, pastor gets sick, and I get a message yesterday morning about 8 o'clock saying, hey, I need you to preach. It's exactly what I was hoping for. Um, fortunately, and you know, you know, I think a lot of the things that happen in our lives that we think are coincidental or weird uh, are the hand of God in our lives. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a story in Scripture that has been kind of sitting on my heart waiting for me to really dig into it. And so fortunately, I kind of had a good idea of what I wanted to teach about this morning. Um, and so before I get into that, I do, I do need to confess something to you. Some, this is something that many of you probably already know if you know me, uh, and what many of you have probably guessed by my behavior, but I am not originally a um, Texan. I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, you could probably tell by my pink shirt. I don't know what it is exactly about me, but people tend to guess that this is true about me. No, I, I kind of grew up all over the place. My dad was in the Air Force growing up, so I was in uh, Spain, California, Florida, Philippines, Hawaii, Italy, Germany, and then Florida again, and then Texas, um, which there isn't a word for that. Like, I can't, there's not like Texan for that. I, I don't know what that is. Wanderer, nomad, weirdo. Um, it was very complicated to answer the question, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, it usually made me seem very pretentious and weird, and so I just kind of leaned into it and memorized everything very quickly so I could just spit it out and move on with the day. And you know, when I did move here in the year 2005, when I moved to Texas, I, uh, I, 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 I did not like it. And I know this makes me unpopular, uh, and, and it's just the truth. I didn't really like it. Um, and I really thought that I would be here for a very short season. Because when I first visited here in 2003, I experienced some very real culture shock. Um, you know, in all the various countries and states that I'd lived outside of Texas, I had never, ever in my life experienced so much pride in their state as I did in Texas. When I first got here, I went to a summer camp in, in East Texas called Sky Ranch, filled with 19 and 20-year-old A&M and UT and students that, exactly, which all I ever heard every time that school was mentioned was some loud whooping noise that perplexed me. I did not know what that meant. I didn't understand it, and it was all the time. I'd never, if you'd asked me to pick out the flag of Texas, I might have picked it out if, after a few guesses. But I never, I don't know what the flag of Florida looks like. I, I don't know. I think California's has a bear on it. But other than that, the only flag of America that I can really identify is Texas because, my Lord, you people love that flag. <laughs> I, it was everywhere. It was on shirts. I had, I've seen people with tattoos of it, uh, people with tattoos of the state of Texas. I mean, if you've got a tattoo of the state of Florida, I'm just, I'm not going to even go beyond that. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, I was shocked. I wanted, I wanted to go back home. I wanted to go back to anywhere. Um, Texans were, in my opinion, at that time, so loud, so obnoxious, and so prideful that I, I just didn't want to be there. And if 2003 me could see 2022 me now, he would be very angry with me for spending all this time in this place that I thought was so frustrating and so weird that I wanted to leave as fast as I could. The thing is now, I, I truly love it here. I love this place. Texas is, is my now home. I've never lived anywhere as long as I've lived in Texas. It's, it's the place where I've put down roots, the place where I've support, grown a family. It's, it's home to me now, but 2003 me would have kicked my teeth out for staying here this long. And as I look back now over the 16 years that I've spent in this place, I have the eyes to see all of God's handiwork in bringing me to the place that has been the stage of the most fulfilling, joyful, yet often difficult years of my life. So I want to tell you briefly just kind of how I got here in the first place. Um, my best friend from high school, his name is Kelly. He's actually a principal in uh, a school in Arlington right now. He went to Texas Tech. There's no real sound, is there, for that? that you just put guns in the air? I don't... If my wife were here, she would be... She's probably watching it and yelling it right now. Um, so he and I had not really spent a lot of time together, and he said, hey, I'm going to be working at this camp in, in, in East Texas. You should come. And I said, Why? 
And he said, so we can hang out. And I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good reason. So cut to, you know, a couple days later, I'm in my 10 by 10 dorm room on my uh, handheld non-cell phone um, interviewing with a man named Brad in Texas. Now, he did a very bad job interviewing me. He did not ask me a lot of questions. He just sort of told me about the camp and then offered me a job. That was not a good call. He did a bad job interviewing me. Um, he knew very little about me. I'm not even positive he knew that I lived in Florida. Um, and so it turns out I was the only person that had ever been interviewed in that state for a job in Texas. They had never talked to anybody pretty much outside of like Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana to come and work at this camp. And so when, and I found this out later, when he did hire me, the other directors of the camp were very confused and a little annoyed because they did not have, they, they, the whole thing it was so weird to me. And they knew it would be because I'd never really been to Texas. I didn't know what it was like. I didn't even know what summer camp really was. All I thought summer camp was, if you've ever seen the movie Heavyweights, it's about kids that show up and they spend like all summer riding go-karts and, and, and warring against the camp directors, whatever it is. That's what I thought camp was. And so I had no idea that these kids just show up for a week and then they leave. That confused me. I didn't know anything about this job, and he hired me anyway. Bad call for Brad. But it turns out I came, and while Texas confused me, I truly fell in love with that type of ministry, with getting to know those kids and, and hanging out with them, cra playing crazy games, going on zip lines and going in the lake and blobbing them. I would get in trouble a lot because I don't know if you know what the blob is, but I'm going to tell it to you. It's a big, giant pillow in a lake, right? You put one kid on the end, you jump, and they fly up in the air. The camp had a rule that you couldn't be more than 15 pounds heavier than the person on the blob because then they might reach into the stratosphere. This felt like a challenge to me. And so we had a system, my other counselors and I, where we would make sure that some of the, nobody of any real importance was around and we would go for it and we would find the smallest kid. And these were like 10 year olds. We'd find the smallest 10 year old we had, throw them out there and one of us much larger people would jump, and oh my gosh, the joy and fulfillment that I felt in those moments where I'm, I'm laying there and I can see this kid flailing and falling off and on his face into the water. It was joy. Um, I recommend each and every one of you try it. And, and it doesn't feel as good unless you're breaking the rules, so make sure you are, in fact, breaking the rules. It feels better. Um, I fell in love with this job. I, I, it made no sense to me. It was in no way related to my current path of career. I, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to go on and be a college English professor. I wanted to wear a jacket with the el elbow patches and smoke a pipe in class somehow. I, wasn't gonna, I don't know how I was going to do that, but I wanted it. That's what I wanted. But I came and I fell in love with this job. And as it turns out, there was this really cute dark-haired girl that worked there too that I was really into. Um, and so I came back um, and I couldn't stop myself. The camp was great. That girl was pretty great, too. And so even though I started a career in Florida where my connections were, where my family was, where my friends were, where I knew the, 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 the culture and the life there, I had a job as a teacher. It was a great job. I was teaching, and I was coaching, and they were paying me relatively well for a small private Christian school. Um, and so I did a dumb thing and quit and moved to Lubbock. I don't know why. If you've ever been to Lubbock, there's a certain time of day where a smell just sort of wafts in. And I happened to arrive there on that day. And I thought, this is, this is my life. I'm going to live in a smelly place so I can be near this very beautiful dark-haired girl who, she was enchanting, still is. So I left Florida. I moved to a very smelly place. So that I could be, and this is the silly thing, when you really, when I was thinking about it last night, when I was, I probably had only spent the equivalent of about two weeks with her at this point. We, we, we spoke a lot long distance. We did a whole year when I was in Florida and she was in Texas. We visited each other twice, um, which amounted to about two weeks. Because really, when I met her at camp, we didn't really like each other that much. I was just I'm very attracted to this girl. She found me obnoxious. I don't know why. And... Um, so we really didn't get to know each other until the last week. So I, I'd only spent about two weeks with this girl, and I moved across the country to be near her. 
And one year later, I was, we were married. I married this woman, and without a lot of thought towards my career, which I had still dreamed of having, I moved to East Texas, and we took full-time jobs at that place called Sky Ranch, and it was there that we met some of the most wonderful people that are still in our lives today. It's there that we started our family, and from there, we moved to Houston and, and for moving into church ministry, and then Dallas, and then here. And you know, so many of those choices, when you isolate them and look at them from the outside, they really seem ridiculous. I shouldn't have gone to work at a summer camp in the first place. I was a college soccer player, which you can clearly tell. All, I was all conference. I was captain of the team my sophomore year. I should have been home training and preparing for my last year. That year, they actually started a camp for the players that I didn't go to because I was out in East Texas. I lost my starting spot that year. I lost it. My senior year, gone. It was a bad choice. I had all this connections and family in Florida. Like I said, I had a good job. I got to do the things that I was loving. I was on the right path, and I left it. Not a very smart choice. I shouldn't have left behind my teaching career for some backwoods East Texas camp job, but over and over again, I made what were perceived to be by many in my family and in my friend circles backwards, poorly thought out choices. But with the, with the sight that I have now, I can tell so clearly that they were in fact the machinations of a loving God who wanted me to be right here, right now, doing exactly what I'm doing today. And there is nowhere else that I would rather be. And so if we look at the choices of our main characters in this story today, Mary and Joseph, if we look at their choices from the outside, they seem random, sporadic, and foolish. But when we look at them through the lens provided to us by Scripture, we can see that though they weren't the most practical, they led them to exactly where they needed to be. So before we get into the actual passage that we're going to read of Mary and Joseph leaving and going to Egypt, this is our story for today. I want to give you just a little bit of context. Of course, we've heard the story of the three wise men. We know that at some point before Jesus was born, a star appeared that had never been seen before. And these three wise men who studied the stars, three, four, five, who knows how many there were, uh, studied the stars. They knew the skies and they knew that something was weird. Something was off. Something was new. And they had known, even they knew the Old Testament that pointed to a, a scripture in Numbers that said, a star will come from, from Jacob, a star will come from Israel, and they knew to follow it. So they got up and they followed it. And that led them to the court of a king named Herod. Herod was given a title by Julius Caesar himself, the king of the Jews, and he held this title very closely. Um, he reported directly to Rome, but he was in charge of all of Israel, all of those who dwelt in that land. He was the king of them, and he was favored by, by Caesar himself, and he held those titles and those, those relationships very closely, and when they were challenged or when they were threatened, he did everything he could to keep them, including the murder of many of his own wives and children, so that he could not lose his power. So when these men walk in the, in the court and say, hey, we are coming to see the new king of the Jews, something happens in Herod. Something triggers in him to say, no, you're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. So, you know, he asks them, go and find them. He gets his priests together and say, yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem. This is the even real thing. And so the, the wise men leave and they go. And he tells them, please come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him, which we all know what he really wanted to do. You know, Herod is near at, at the end of his life, he's near the end of his reign, and he's desperate to hold on to that power. And these, these magi, these wise men, they go, they meet Jesus, they meet Mary and Joseph, and they, they lavish them with these very expensive, very valuable gifts. And then they leave and go back another way, being told in a dream not to go back and report to Herod, and so they're gone. And then Joseph has a dream, and it says this in Matthew 2, 13. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Now, this is a crucial moment in this story, because if, honestly, if I were Joseph, if I were Joseph in this moment, I would be incredibly confused. 
I would be tempted to think things like, if this child that you just gave me is the son of God, can't you deal with this problem, please? Why do I have to leave? We were here in Bethlehem because that's where the scripture said that the Messiah would come from. And now you want me to flee to Egypt? God, just deal with it. This, this King Herod wants to kill him? Can you, can you kill him, please? Can you shut that down? Can you change his mind? Can you do something? Why do me and my young wife, who just had a baby, have to get up and take this infant and move across the world to a different place? That, that's my that's where my head would be. That's where my head would be for sure. Thankfully, Joseph didn't quibble with God. He obeyed immediately. They got up that night and left. Joseph wasted no time. And so they go to Egypt. And it's, it's interesting to think about what sort of Egypt did they go to? Because, you know, Egypt went through many different sort of animations of being Egypt. And in this particular period, actually, it's not a bad time to be living in Egypt. You know, there were, there were supposedly many different, many Jews in Israel at this time. At least um, we know that in the third century BC, Ptolemy, the first pharaoh of Egypt after the Greeks took over, um, went to Israel and kidnapped over 100,000 Jews and brought them to Egypt to work as slaves and, and soldiers. And it was his son, Philadelphus, that actually freed them. But because of the prosperous you know, state that Egypt was in, many of those Jews remained there and lived lives and set up communities and they would have built synagogues. And there were, the place that Jesus was brought to as an infant was not a place that was hostile to the Jews, but rather one that would have been very welcoming and there would have been a community waiting there to allow them to come in and live and, and continue to, to grow and live in their type of culture. Do I think that 300 years before this, that God called Ptolemy to go bring 100,000 Jews to, Israel, to Egypt? Probably not. But he sure did work it out for the positive. He brought his son to a safe place, a place that was safe away from those that would try to hurt him and destroy him. He did not send his son to a foreign, inhospitable home, but rather to a place where Joseph, Jesus' father, could have found work, and he gave him plenty of money to start this new life. You see, these wise men unknowingly brought trouble upon Jesus and his family, but then it was their gifts that provided the means of their prosperity in this new place. They, they didn't show up to Egypt empty-handed. They had an abundance of valuable items, gold, frankincense, and myrrh that they could have easily sold to make a living for themselves. And so what happened in Bethlehem after the family moved to Egypt? Well, it's not great. Matthew 2, 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. You know, it's difficult to guess how many children would have been killed in this, at this time, but it's, it's most likely somewhere between 20 to 50 and it is a true tragedy brought about by a very dark mind bent on holding power. You see, hate and unbridled wrath, armed with an unlawful power, often transports men to the most absurd and unreasonable instances of cruelty. I think about the king that ordered this, and I think about the, the men that had to carry it out, and I think how much they needed this Christ that we were trying to kill. How desperately they needed what they didn't even know they were trying to destroy. And so what of these children? You know, as I read it, I thought, are not these children the very first martyrs? The first ones that laid their life down for the sake of Christ? The first innocents who died so that Christ's saving work might be fulfilled? unknowingly taking on the death meant for Jesus so that he could take on their death on the cross. So anywhere from a few months to several years, Joseph made a life for his family in Egypt. And when I read the story, I can't help but consider the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 1.9 where he says, that which has been shall be again. Because you see, this isn't the first time that God brought a group of people to Israel that he needed to keep safe. 
This, this mirrors the story of the Hebrews in Exodus who moved to Egypt. In fact, it's in Genesis where Joseph brings his family, this small little family that blossoms into over a million to two million people, into Egypt to grow safely in their infancy. He used Egypt to incubate his young infant people, the Hebrews, until they could stand on their own to be his people, his adopted child. Again, God sends his son, Jesus, into Egypt as an infant to shelter him from danger and grow safely. That which has been shall be again. And finally, Herod dies. And Joseph has another dream. Matthew 2, 19 to 20 says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph again moves his family back to Israel, presumably planning to return to Bethlehem, where the boy was born because one of, but because one of Herod's famously dangerous sons, Archelaus, was governing those lands, Joseph had another dream where he was told to go back to Nazareth, a place that if you know about Nazareth, Joseph was most likely trying to, to shake from his feet. Nazareth was not a great place. It was not a hospitable place. It was home to the Roman garrison for the northern regions of Galilee, filled with soldiers and Roman officials and people that probably cared very little for the Jews that they were in charge of. If they could help it, Jews chose not to live in Nazareth. It was home to the enemy. But this was exactly where God wanted his son to grow up, a place where no one would have expected him to be. Now, this story, and I'm sure many of our own stories, when analyzed through the lens of practicality, ambition, and conventional wisdom, can be easily seen as ludicrous and downright foolish. Why would you take the promised Savior away from Israel? Why would you not strike down all dangers in his path? Why would you not do all you can to set him up for success as a future leader of Israel? Why would he not grow up in Bethlehem or Jerusalem or where a Messiah would be expected to come from? And honestly, the simple answer that I can come up with as I look at this and I think about Scripture as a whole is just that, that, that God, God knows best. I didn't have any plan or desire to raise a family in Texas, but God knows best. I would have never thought that I would be homeschooling my children, which I typically do just to make people uncomfortable. I would have never thought I would be homeschooling my children, but God knows best. I thought I would be a professional soccer player at some point or a coach or a college English professor, but God knows best. All of my plans for my life would have brought me far away from where God wanted me, away from my lovely wife, my beautiful children, and the job I was born to carry out. It was God's great wisdom and mercy for my life that none of my plans came to fruition. I am right where God wants me to be. Joseph had plans, ambitions, life goals. Mary probably never woke up as a young girl and hoped one day that she could be pregnant out of wedlock. It'd be so great. I'd have so much shame and, and hate from so many people. It'd be awesome. She also probably never hoped that she would give birth to that child surrounded by barnyard animals, all alone, with nobody else there but her husband. She also probably never hoped that she would have to transplant that family away from everything that she's ever known. And then... She also probably never got down on her knees and prayed that one day she would have to watch her son be tortured and executed in front of her. These are things that Mary never would have wanted. But they happened because God knows best. Thank God for the decisive faith of Joseph and Mary. Without them, where would we be? I thank God for my foolish choices because without them, where would I be? And what about you? When we follow God and surrender ourselves to him, we leave behind a trail of strange choices that lead us to exactly where God wants us. And this year, as we step out into a strange new year, my encouragement to you is to hold loosely to your plans and ambitions. 
but hold ever so tightly to your love and devotion to a God that knows best for you. Hold ever tightly to that love because it is the greatest ambition that we can have is to be someone who is guided by their love for God, by their love for others, not by our ambition, not by our own plans, but rather by the love for the one that has a better plan for you. Over and over again, God has proven himself faithful in this area. We have thousands of years of history to look back and see the loving machinations of a merciful God working for the good of his people. Because what has been will be again. Let me pray for you. God, your love and devotion for us is confusing. We are fumbling and stumbling in the dark and you provide a light that we cling to. God, help each and every one of us to listen to your plans, to give of ourselves fully to you and to love you and to love others in such a way that guides us to the best life we can live, one that is lived, devoted to you. God, help us to hold loosely to those things that would distract us from what you have for us. And God, we ask this year for your blessing that you would look down on us poor, frail people who just want to please you. And you would provide for us. You would strengthen us. You would, you would bolster our strength and will and move us along the path that you have prepared for us. We ask this in your wonderful, loving name.